hope I hope we don't have any any children falling into any bodies of water today. <laughs> Speaking of that, I am now recording. <laughs> Perfect. And I share, I share our um, mutual goal for the t today to not have um, any children fall in bodies of water, as well <laughs> as um, hopefully having an, an excellent, um, an excellent webcast today. I want to thank everyone for for tuning in um, and joining us on the River Rising Solutions webcast. I'm Shannon Blankenship, the Adv Advocacy Director at St. John's Riverkeeper, joined by my co-host virtually, Jimmy Orth, our Executive Director. Uh, today we're going to discuss the most effective climate change solution that exists, which is you voting. Uh, Aliki Moncrief of Florida Conservation Voters is going to join us to talk about how your vote can change the climate change conversation in Florida. Today, we're going to cover the work that we do to educate voters, inform our elected leaders. We're then going to have Aliki join us to talk about how we can focus on solutions to climate policy and how that's connected to the election process. And then last, we'll end with viewer comments. So stick around. You're invited to, um, to join us to participate. If you're watching this on Facebook Live, um, go to stjonesriverkeeper.org and um, find out how to jump in on the Zoom um, uh, webcast here so that you can participate in the conversation. Um, but Jimmy, I wanted to um, turn it over to you and ask if you will maybe talk to people a little bit more about St. John's Riverkeeper and why we're having this webcast today. Yeah, absolutely. If you've uh, tuned into our previous uh, webcast, you've already heard this spiel before, but I'm going to be quick and just let everybody know who may not be familiar with St. John's Riverkeeper. We are an advocacy group for the St. John's River, a nonprofit, and we do that through, we advocate through many ways. We we work directly with elected officials and try to advocate for policies that are going to protect the St. John's. We try to make sure that obviously those their laws and regulations are adequate and also being enforced. And that's something too, is holding our regulatory agencies accountable and also polluters accountable. Um, we also are actively involved with a lot of outreach and education programs that we've initiated. We have, um, we do a lot in the community. Unfortunately, right now we've had to take everything online and be virtual. Um, but we do a lot of cleanups and we also have an education staff that, that goes into the schools and provides programming. And this, now, obviously, they're not going into the schools, but we've developed a lot of great resources. If you're interested, you can go to our website and see them under the education section on our website. Um, they've done a lot of great videos that are, um, in, uh, that are educational about various topics about water quality. And so it's been great because we've, we've expanded our toolbox of things that we can offer to the community. And so in some ways, that's, I guess, the, the silver lining in this whole pandemic is that we've actually now have more resources to offer the community and we're actually more skilled at uh, using um, these different types of uh, strategies to reach people. Um, we started this campaign, River Rising, really because of the dredging. When, the, when we started really d digging into the impacts to the dredging of the St. John's, we started realizing that it was going to exacerbate the impacts that are already going to happen from sea level rise and climate change by increasing water levels during storm surge and also by increasing the likelihood of flooding in low-lying areas. And so we realized that not only were people not that aware about what was happening with the dredging, but they also really were not aware of what was happening with sea level rise and the, and the vulnerability of communities along the St. John's River. So after Hurricane Irma, that was really the time we decided we have to get out there and make sure that our elected officials and our citizens are responding to this threat and don't just look at this storm as an anomaly that um, we, we realized a year after the storm, there really was virtually no conversation taking place about the impacts of that storm, which caused historic flooding in Jacksonville, and realized that some action was needed. And so we started a series of town hall meetings, river rising town hall meetings, where we engaged with the community, raised a lot of awareness. And I'm actually pleased to say that one of our main um, initiatives, what we were, one of our big uh, calls to action was to encourage our elected leaders, particularly in Jacksonville, to hire a chief resiliency officer. And only two years after that campaign started, 
uh, Mayor Payton has it in his budget for this year that'll go before city council for approval in October. So we were really pleased. It wasn't just our efforts, but we felt like we, we served as a catalyst to help make that happen. And there's a lot of other things that we've done too to help, I think, start the conversation and start initiating some action in Jacksonville. So then Shannon and I realized now's the time we also have to really start talking, not just raising awareness about the impacts, but we have to start talking about the solutions. What are the solutions to climate change, sea level rise? And so that was how this uh, webinar series began. Well, that's a, a great segue, Jimmy. And I, um, I do just want to, you mentioned Mayor, Mayor Payton in there, and I just want to make sure <laughs> that folks know we're <laughs> Did I say Mayor Payton? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy's been doing this a few years uh, uh, and, and was still at it, Mayor Curry. Um, yes, but no, Mayor Jimmy, that, that, that's a great segue. You know, impactful solutions to climate change and sea level rise are necessary for the overall health and protection of the St. John's. That's why we started this. Um, this series to really focus on what are the solutions, how do we get there. So I want to start today's episode by giving some background on the work that we at St. John's Riverkeeper, along with partner organizations, are doing that will help get us closer to enacting good, strong, enforceable climate change policies and rising water solutions. At the foundation of our work, so after knowing the science, right, after understanding the threats, um, we do a lot of work to educate and inform our membership, as Jimmy mentioned. Um, uh, we have to understand how it's being impacted by climate change and make sure that we're communicating the need for more protective policies. So we have to do that first. Then we also have to work directly with our elected leaders and the candidates to talk about issues impacting the river and how they have such a large role in those solutions. Um, for everyone who's a member of ours, you know, we release responses to candidate surveys, you know, unbiased, just what they said um, to our membership uh, so that our members know uh, the, the positions that different elected leaders will take on these issues. And then once elected, we try to then meet with our elected leaders to discuss the relevant and timely legislation that's impacting the river. During session, uh, we're meeting with our elected leaders again, and many of you know, we'll probably reach out to you directly to say, you need to ask your um, uh, uh, member of the legislature to vote a, a particular way, depending on what legislation we're following, either vote yes or vote no, and here's why. Now, all of this work, of course, is important, but the harder that we can work in the beginning to elect the right people into office, the better a chance we're gonna have of getting those smart climate change solutions um, uh, put into place. In other words, the best thing that we can do for solutions to rising waters is to elect people that acknowledge, understand, and then will lead on aggressive climate change policy at every level of government. Um, so before we introduce our speaker today, Jimmy, I thought you might just be able to, again, since you've been doing this for St. John's Riverkeeper a while, give us a little bit of a background on why this topic is so um, uh, critical and fundamental in the work that we do. Well, you know, I think when I've been asked over the years, like, what's the one most important thing you can do to help protect the river? I've always told people to vote because it really does, all of these policies stem from our elected leaders who are supposed to represent our interests. And I think that we've seen over the years that we can actually enact really strong policy if we have the right leaders in place and that they act and our leaders act in a bipartisan fashion. A good example is in 1972, when the Clean Water Act was passed, I'm always stunned and amazed by this, but every, every senator voted yes to support that. It was unanimous bipartisan legislation that passed the Wa Clean Water Act, which is one of the most significant pieces of legislation ever pa passed, um, environmental legislation in the United States. Also that same year, Florida passed the Florida Water Resources Act, which is another example of good government. That statute has been widely recognized for its creation as one of the most comprehensive and progressive water regulatory systems in the nation. We were actually a model for the nation for an awful long time. It provided a foundation and framework for protecting our water resources for decades to come. But then I think you can see where, um, you know, we have, when Governor Rick Scott came in, he took a completely different approach. And so here's an example where years of progress in terms of, of developing legislation and policies that are more protective of our resources can be undermined. He 
he was very to, under when a concerted effort to undermine the provisions of the of Florida's water law, weakening, eliminating numerous regulatory protections, expediting permits with little review, um, undermining the effectiveness of many of the institutions like the water management district. He even you know allegedly told government employees they were not allowed to use the words climate change. And so what happened, and then another thing I'm always astounded by is he actually eliminated the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, whole, the agency that was responsible for, for smart growth management in the state. And so what we're doing now is we're actually having to dig out of that and try to rebuild those policies that were undermined under, and I think that's just a good example of how we, how important it is to elect people that are going to continue to protect our environment and do so in a, in a bipartisan way, which we've seen in the past is possible, and we can do so again. Well, again, great segue, and I am very excited now to introduce our, oh no, let me go back. I'll get, I'll get back there, <laughs> to introduce our featured speaker. Aliki Moncrief received her JD from Harvard Law School and her BA from Emory University. She's worked in the Department of Environmental Protection's Enforcement Section of the Office of General Counsel. She became the Executive Director of Environment Florida, a grassroots environmental advocacy organization working on both state and federal environmental policy. She later became Deputy Campaign Manager of Florida's Water and Land Legacy, which led the campaign to pass the Water and Land Conservation Amendment that won 75% of the vote in the November 2014 election. Ms. Moncrief is the Executive Director of Florida Conservation Voters and the Florida Conservation Voters Education Fund, which emerged from the successful campaign and now focuses on educating, electing, and holding Florida's elected officials accountable for their environmental actions. So Aliki, thank you so much for joining us today and lending your expertise to this conversation. I want to ask you, um, Florida's, Florida conservation voters wasn't always focused specifically on our elected leadership. So tell us how you guys got started and the transition into what your current strategies are. Sure. Well, first off, let me just say thank you so much for having me today. These River Rising podcasts have been such an incredible um, outreach uh, to, to folks. And like you said, Jimmy, you know, these are hard times and challenging times, but the silver lining is in some ways we're actually all more connected. Um, and so your River Rising podcast, I think, is one of those great things that has emerged and it, you know, it, that's really helping to help ev you know, keep everybody connected. So I am just really pleased to be here. Thank you so much. Um, like you said, Shannon, we weren't always focused on elections and, and candidates in particular. Um, Florida Conservation Voters is actually a relatively new conservation organization in Florida. We didn't become FCV until 2015, and we were a direct outgrowth of the Water and Land Conservation Amendment. Um, in 2012, that's when the Water and Land Conservation Amendment really got started. Partners like St. John's River Keeper were, were there at the table from the very first day. And it was really the environmental community in Florida reacting to what you were describing, Jimmy, which was a dismantling of environmental protections, and in particular, a defunding of really critical conservation programs like Florida Forever. And, and, and Everglades restoration down, you know, in the southern part of the state and other really great environmental programs. So, you know, the environmental community got together and said, you know, we know voters actually prioritize the environment. We know the environment is a, bi a, bi a bipartisan issue. Um, we know that it, it's, it's, a, it's above party. Um, and so let's go straight to the voters and take this issue to them and ask them to refund these critical conservation programs. So from 2012 to 2014 that, that you mentioned, Shannon, that was the campaign to put this issue in front of voters. Um, one of the things that even in the, in the midst of that campaign we were talking about is the fact that Florida's environmental community has such an, an incredible wealth of scientists, an incredible wealth of you know, folks who have expertise in bringing lawsuits and, and holding um, people accountable to the law. Um, one thing that we saw we didn't really have in a robust way was a political organization. 
that could back candidates. And so we, we took the enthusiasm. Um, I often think of the water and land amendment as kind of politics light because the environment was on the ballot. It wasn't a person, it wasn't a candidate, it wasn't all of the things that sometimes people feel negative feelings about elections. And we went from politics light to like full on politics. And so now we, we do do the work of um, endorsing candidates who are gonna be climate champions, water champions, uh, champions for our public lands. Um, and so that's, um, that's kind of how, that's how we got started. We got started as that grassroots focus. Um, the environment was on the ballot and now we're working to keep the environment on the ballot, but through uh, helping great candidates win. So we can get to a point where we have a conservation majority in the state house, the state senate, and in the governor's office. Are you muted? Yeah, sorry. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I understand the transition that you have had to this more voter focus, which I as a voter really appreciate the hard work that you guys do to help me stay informed. Um, but you do continue to spend a lot of time in your work elevating the need to protect land and water and making sure that we all know what we have to lose. So tell us about some of the important land here in North Florida that you guys continue to, to focus on in your work. Sure. Well, partly because of where we came from, um, coming from a constitutional amendment that was very much focused on funding for conservation lands. We're never going to let that go. We're always going to be part of the, the, the great um, coalitions of, of organizations and people in Florida who are fighting for that. Um, you know, the Water and Land Amendment was designed to be upwards of, you know, coming along here soon, a billion dollars a year dedicated to the Land Acquisition Trust Fund. And the idea was for a healthy portion of that to go to restoring the Florida Forever Program, which had been historically $300 million a year, which actually was like, I mean, that, that is a more robust program than almost than really any other state in the country. Other states were looking at us saying, wow, that's something that Florida does right. Um, and so in, in, in our effort to continue continually educate lawmakers about why Florida Forever is important to keep funding, why public lands matter. Um, one of the things that we've done is we, we've published what we call a GEMS report. Um, and this, this goes and looks at Florida Forever projects, past and future. So past GEMS that people know about and that, are, that people appreciate um, to sort of try to put a real, you know, they talk about this expression, putting a face to the name. We're trying to put a place to Florida forever for these lawmakers. And so we look at, at existing lands kind of brought to you by Florida forever. We also look at those that are hanging in the balance and that remain um, unprotected. So in North Florida, um, Northeast Florida, there's, there's the Northeast Florida Blue Way, which is one of the projects on the Florida Forever list that we've highlighted. Um, it's along the Intercoastal Highway. It's really important in terms of providing critical link linkages between other existing conservation lands. It's also really important because a lot of these lands actually protect water quality. And that's one of the message we're, messages we're always trying to drive home in partnership with groups like St. John's Riverkeeper, drive home to legislators. And that is protecting land in Florida is protecting water. Protecting land in Florida is protecting communities from sea level rise and from the impacts of climate change. Protecting land is part of the solution. Um, I mean, we can talk about carbon sequestration. The list is the list goes on and on <laughs> in terms of like all of the many ways in which protecting land protects and, and, and ensures that we have um, other goals that, that are met. Um, so North Florida, um, the, the, the Northeast Florida Blue Way is one of those projects we're always talking to lawmakers about. Um, and so the GEMS report is really, that's our effort at education. I will say this last legislative session, the legislature did allocate 100 million to Florida Forever, uh, which is an improvement over the, the previous couple of years. It is a never ending fight to get more of the land acquisition trust fund money appropriately spent as voters intended. 
Um, I, I just really want to thank you for doing that. I think a lot of people, no matter where you are, you know your nearby parks, you know your nearby um, uh, places for for recreation and and for wildlife and and to to see water, but you don't know what's possibly right mm -hmm. could be a park, right? Could be the next really large important parcel. Um, of, of property. And so um, having, you know, organizations like yours continue to highlight the gems, you know, the, the pieces of property out there that we have acquired and the additional adjacent properties that we need to continue to acquire for corridors and for um, uh, all these different really, really important and valuable reasons, I think is great. So thanks for continuing to beat that drum, even though you have sort of transitioned a little bit into more um, of this focus on our voters. And with that, I, I just wanted um, something that I keep hearing about, and I'm hoping you can just sort of like help to, um, to bring it in full circle, but there's so much surrounding the idea of voter turnout mm -hmm. and that we have to get a strong voter turnout in order to have effective um, uh, you know, voices and leaders on climate change issues. And so tell me about y'all's work to really just start at the beginning and, and try and get more voters to show up to polling places. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the reasons that we do work on uh, voter turnout and one of the reasons we believe it matters is because, as I mentioned earlier, the environment is really not a partisan issue. Um, people from all walks of life, all regions of the state, regardless of race, age, political party, when you ask them about protecting public lands, when you ask them, are you worried about climate change? Do you want to see bolder action from your lawmakers on sea level rise? Um, when you ask them these questions about the environment, um, and yeah, Amendment 1 is a great example, the slide that you just put up, voters resoundingly say yes, <laughs> and so part of why we try to turn people out is because the more people who vote, uh, the more people who are carrying that environmental value and those goals into the ballot box. Um, so yeah, this slide, I just kind of wanted to, you know, we actually are, you know, we're an environmental organization, but we do get involved obvi obviously in elections. So we're always keeping track of, well, how, how's the registration going? Um, how, how many voters, how many new voters are coming to the, uh, you know, are, are becoming, um, what's the expression? They talk about the, the voting as a franchise, right? Which I think is always a little bit funny because I think of like McDonald's as a franchise too. But um, so we keep track of these things. And I just wanted to share, you know, you can see in this graph that pre-pandemic, there was a lot of registration going on. And the pandemic put a bit of a dent um, in the numbers, but we're seeing a comeback. Um, and so there, there, our electorate is growing. One of the things about Florida that's a constant is the electorate is constantly growing. It's constantly changing too. And that's another thing that this slide shows is you can see so many voters actually choose not to go one party or another. Um, Flor most counties in Florida have at least a third of the electorate that are not choosing a political party, um, which again, just kind of goes to that idea that there are a lot of voters who care about the issues, they care about the environment, they're not necessarily gonna side with one party or the other. Um, the environment is actually, I would say probably the most powerful um, swing issue in Florida. Um, people really are gonna look at candidates and make a decision in close calls um, based on, well, how are they on water quality? You know, what are they doing to, to put um, Florida on a clean energy future? Um, so, I mean, the other reason it's important is in, I mean, there's so much polling happening now because we're in the middle of an electoral cycle. Um, so much of that polling is showing that Floridians are not only well aware uh, that climate change is happening, but they know it is impacting their lives today and they want clean energy solutions. They want policies that are going to help make their communities more resilient. Um, and so that's, that's what we're doing. We, we put a lot of effort into, you know, getting that research, really trying to understand, you know, of the voters who are going to be voting, is the environment, like, how does the environmental message rank? You know, if we've, I mean, the reality is you, for voters, you, you often do have to connect 
I mean, we all know environmental issues are complicated. They're so, so complicated. A lot of what our job is, is making it real for people and connecting it to their lived experience. Because when you do that, um, instead of it, instead of environment being at the bottom of the list for them, it, it really quickly rises to the very top of, of what's driving them. Um, so a lot of the voters we're reaching out to this cycle are younger voters um, to make sure that newer voters um, are part of the process. Um, we reach out to indep independent voters a lot um, because they, they don't always get as much messaging. Um, and that's kind of, you know, this slide just kind of shows you a little bit, gives you a flavor for what the electorate is looking like um, this year. I thought, you know, Lakey, it's interesting because, as you know, you've been involved in environmental issues for a long time. And it was always so frustrating for year after year to see polling, like what's the most important issue to you as a voter? And the environment would be ranked way down at the bottom, you know, and, and I've really the shift and how quickly it shifted is to me is what's the most, one of the most surprising and encouraging things, frankly, is mm -hmm. that people actually now it's it is like you said, it can be a swing issue now. Um, mm -hmm. where before it never was, even if people were concerned. And I'm, and I'm really encouraged to see, I just saw a poll actually a couple of days ago that um, I think it was Guardian put out that seven in 10 voters want government action on climate change. And so that's really high. And then also the fact that groups like Latinos, it is, they are one of the, the most concerned groups of people about climate change and want to see action. So we're really seeing a shift and it's not so much a bipartisan, it's not so much of a partisan issue anymore either. You're seeing a shift across the board yeah. in terms of uh, opinions on this issue and, and the priority that it should rank in terms of um, their votes. Yeah, it's been, it's been um, happening for a while, but, and, and I think you're right, like it's all of a it's, you know, all this stuff's happening under the surface, you don't realize it. And then when it pops through the surface, um, it's really clear now. Even on the Water and Land Amendment in 2014, which was like a, I mean, if you think about it as like a more maybe traditional conservation, you know, it's money for parks, money for buying land, um, money to buy land to protect water. Um, even with that amendment, that when we did the, the post analysis on who actually voted for this, uh, it was one of the, it was honestly one of the most um, eye-opening moments for me because the support for Amendment 1 in Latino communities in Florida and in Black communities, we looked at it precinct by precinct, was higher than in predominantly white areas of Florida. Um, so what, what you just said, Jimmy, like that all of the, the research and, and um, data that we see is that that's absolutely true. Um, well, so this year, the pandemic, in addition to sort of putting a, a, an early wrench that we're making a comeback from on voter registration, has really also shifted the way that people vote. So many more people are voting by mail this year. Um, and so you can just see the numbers here in this chart. Um, you know, Florida has just over 20 million people. Um, the electorate this year, I think, is going to be probably around 16 million. Um, and so you can see this is data from the primary, right, which is uh, not a high turnout election. Many more people show up for the general election than they do in the primary. And even in the primary, you can see the, the incredible numbers of people requesting uh, their vote by mail ballots. Um, part of the work that we're doing is making sure that people know it is safe and secure. Um, and the thing about voting by mail, this is something that Florida does actually really well compared to other states. We've had this system for a long time. And um, I always think about, uh, think about your vote by mail ballot as insurance because you can always get your mail ballot and then you have options. You can put it in the mailbox, you can drop it off at an early voting location, or if you decide you wanna go, and go into a, a ballot box on, on a early voting day or election day, you can bring your ballot with you and exchange it for your paper ballot. So it's really just a great way to make sure that you keep all your options open, um, especially during a pandemic. That's, that's really important. Aliki, I wanna, yeah. um, I wanna ask you uh, 
you know, you guys are doing a lot actually, you know, to, to turn out the vote, to get people to vote. Um, but what about some of the work that you guys are doing to educate voters before election day? I, I know you have a lot of resources for them. What are, what are some of the resources that you, um, that you've created for people to know who we should be voting for? Sure. Well, we, we still are a pretty new organization and we're, so we're pretty small. Um, and so our strategy with elections um, is, you know, one, providing those how to vote resources. We have a website, flvoterinfo.org, and it's like a one-stop shopping, request your ballot. You know, it's all the mechanics and nuts and bolts of actually voting. Um, we also make endorsements. And we, the way that we make endorsements is we don't have blanket endorsements for every single race in the state. It's not a... You, you get the green check of approval um, strategy. The strategy is we do the research, we look at past election results, we look at the demographic data and how uh, communities are shifting from one election to the next. And we pinpoint races that we think we can make a difference in on an environmental message. And so if, if there's a race where, you know, the, the um, I mean, just to give you an example, it's like, it's, it's, can we move the needle? If it's a contested race and we have a clear pro-environment candidate and a clear anti-environment candidate, and we're talking a few points of difference, that is a race we're definitely going to get involved in. <laughs> if the, if the uh, divide is too wide, it's one where, at least where we are at now in our organizational development, um, resources are limited. So we have to be really strategic. And I will say, you know, Jimmy, you mentioned earlier, and we, we've been talking about bipartisanship. Unfortunately, the, the wave that Rick Scott rode into Florida on was not limited to Rick Scott. And the amount of um, the partisanship in Florida has gotten so much worse over the last 10 years. We're at this phase where the environment is at, at risk of being politicized. It's, it's at risk of being um, viewed as the, the property or the space of one party over another. And, and so the reality is we are, it's, it is challenging to operate in this really hyper-partisan world when we're talking about a nonpartisan issue. Um, so, we make endorsements. We focus on those areas where we have razor thin margins. Um, we focus, we, we actually um, identify voters who, based on research, modeling, polling, we actually think are gonna be swayed by an environmental message. And that's where we put our resources, is, is to talking to those voters. There, there's a lot there. Thank you guys for doing all that work because there's so much to mine into with this data. And um, I, but I think you're right. I don't see anyone else doing it for um, the environment in particular. So you guys add so much to that. One thing, Shannon, before we move on um, from this, we usually don't do it at this stage, but I do want to address it since it was brought up by a couple of people, if you don't mind. Yeah. But, um, we had a couple of people saying one of the slides, Aliki, showed yeah. that half of the voter Voters, um, mail, the mail-in ballots were valid. It says, wow, amazing that only half of mail, um, voter ballot um, mail-ins were valid. Talk about that, please. Um, um, actually, there's a little number on that side. I got to zoom, and I probably need even a stronger pair of glasses, sadly. <laughs> the rejection rate, oops, the rejection right. rate, that's okay. Um, the rejection rate on that slide is um, what we're looking at here. So it's actually less than 1% of ballots were rejected. Were you saying returned or? It said, does this slide show that only half of votes mailed were valid? No, it doesn't. It says, what this is showing is um, how many were, if, if, if we're talking about the validity of, of um, votes cast, you're, the number you want to look at is this overall rejection rate. In Florida, very few mail ballots are rejected. And for the most part, the reasons they're rejected are because on the outside of your mail ballot, you actually have to sign it and you have to date it. If you don't do that, 
the supervisor of elections actually puts it into kind of a question mark category. And it's their obligation then to track that voter down um, to, to correct or cure that deficiency on the ballot. So the rejection rate for mail ballots in Florida is actually extremely low. And, and like I said earlier, because vote by mail has been something that Florida has been doing under Republican, I mean, it's, it's the administration doesn't matter. Um, it, we've actually got a pretty good system. Um, and yes, I totally agree, Lee. Uh, I think we have a message, we can't even afford one rejection that this is why we encourage folks who are going to vote by mail to get that in early because the supervisors of election of each county are responsible for curing for reaching out to those voters and fixing the problem. So the earlier you get your ballot in, the more likely that they'll identify the problem and be able to correct it. Aliki, what do you guys do after someone gets elected to, to work with them and sort of facilitate their, I guess, continuing education about um, conservation issues? Yeah, we think about all of the, we have sort of this idea of a, there's a cycle of accountability and, you know, there's, you have to, the environmental community talks with lawmakers and candidates about, here's what we want to see, here are our environmental priorities. Um, we communicate those things. In terms of during session, we convene with partners every week during session. Um, there's a, all the groups that have some level of presence in Tallahassee actually work really well together on collaborating and sort of dividing and conquering. Like who's got relationships with whom? Who can carry this message? Who can go and ask for this amendment? Um, we do a briefing book every cycle, which is an educational, when I say we do it, I really mean like the larger we, because it's not just FCV, it's FCV with partners. We're working with all the water keeper, pretty much all the water keepers this year. Um, groups like the Clio Institute that really work a lot on climate, boat solar. Um, we have a really broad set of partners who put this environmental education book together, you know, where lawmakers can learn what are the most important environmental issues? What are some of the top line policies that I should be thinking about in terms of bills to file? Um, so we start there. We, we work together collaboratively with these lobby core, for lack of a better way of putting it, these lobby core meetings. Um, our role as FCV, we do not see ourselves as like the policy experts. Like we rely on partners like you all. You're the science experts, you're the policy experts, you know what needs to happen. Um, we see ourselves as the political muscle so that we can get lawmakers to open the doors to listen to the experts, to listen to the science. And then we also help our organization. The other piece that we do is we help with the strategy you know, the strategy at the legislature, it's not as simple as like filing a bill and kind of letting it go off into the ether and hopefully it'll get some traction. There's a lot, there's so much maneuvering that happens in the Capitol. It's kind of unreal really. Um, so that's part of what we do with the candidates that we help elect and our allies in the legislature is, is if I had to sum up, you know, base, baseline education with our partners connecting lawmakers with experts all over Florida uh, who like to like St. John's Riverkeeper um, and then helping lawmakers strategize about how, how to get those ideas moving and how to get them passed. Do you think, think another, I'm oh, sorry. Jim. No, go ahead, Jimmy. Oh, I was just going to say, I think another part that's just so important and, you know, emphasize everything watching that, you know, really the follow up with legislators from constituents, you know, that we as constituents, we really, yes, we can vote, get people into office, but then we have a responsibility, frankly, to, to develop those relationships with them and make sure that they hear from us because mm -hmm. it does make a difference. And I know that because, you know, they're, they're hearing predominantly from lobbyists. And so we need to overcome that and make sure they're hearing predominantly from the people they represent. And yep. that doesn't always take place. And I think that's really important. I always remember um, also when it's well organized and you do it on a consistent basis, how important it can be. We had um, a workshop one time with former governor Bob Graham and he said that it was actually the uh, chiropractors that were the best 
they, they had the most influence. They would literally come and every month he could expect a call from the same person and they developed a relationship. He got to know them. They would chit chat about family. And, and he said it really was an effective strategy because they be developed a personal relationship. And I think that can go a long way. I couldn't agree with you more. You're totally right that lawmakers are way outnumbered uh, by lobbyists, like paid um, hired gun type lobbyists. Their staff are totally overwhelmed. Um, there's the number of bills that are filed and issues that they have to keep abreast of. Um, it can be really overwhelming. And so I agree with you 100%, like hearing from their constituents um, that that's we that is something we don't do alone, right? That's the entire environmental community. Um, getting our members, getting our supporters together, making sure they know, hey, there's something coming up. Your lawmaker needs to hear from you, and here's you know here's some here's some um, here's what's going on. Like here's the here's the four one one. So yeah, you know you're you're absolutely right. Like that that's actually part of where um, maybe in this like pandemic world, um, it'll somehow help people stay more connected um, with their lawmakers. Because I do sometimes feel like lawmakers go to Tallahassee, they're kind of cordoned off for a couple months, and they need to hear from us all year round. Like, it can't just be during those 60 days of session. Like, they have to be constantly hearing from constituents about what just happened, how do we want to see things change in the future, Meeting with lawmakers in their districts is so much more impactful because they also they're, they don't have as much on their shoulders. It's not that high, high pressure, super fast moving period, which happens during session. They have a little more room to breathe and they have a little more room to listen. You know, we've been talking a lot today about climate and environment, um, obviously, because uh, it connects to this rising waters conversation that that we were, that we really want to have and, and really want to elevate but I do want to connect this all back to social justice because many of these issues do connect back to social justice and I want to find out specifically how at Florida conservation voters are you guys sort of um, intertwining climate environment with social justice yeah I mean that's a that's a really great question I mean for us the way that we are doing it um, organizationally, we've committed to a set of racial justice and equity principles. We're sort of refocusing our efforts on that space of environmental justice, recognizing that when the floodwaters come and recede, when polluted, you know, toxic sites are sited or abandoned, um, the reality is that it's black communities and Latino communities in Florida and throughout the country and, and really uh, I, I can't speak beyond the country <laughs> but these are the communities that are impacted first and they're the communities that get um, relief and aid last and so we've just we've made it a part of our um, our core principles that when we're looking at policies um, it's not just about impacts it's also about making sure that we're working with those communities directly if there's going to be a decision made about a community, the community should be there and be at the table uh, for that decision making process. And so we've done a like, for example, our briefing book um, that I mentioned earlier, you know, there's sections on clean energy and climate, there's sections on water, there's sections on public lands. We actually have sections on democracy and environmental justice too. Uh, and, and so we're working very hard to brought in the, the groups that we work with so that we're reaching far beyond um, environmental organizations and working with organizations that do poverty work or that do um, you know, voting access work. Well, thank you for doing that. I, um, we know that these things are all very connected, but it's great when organizations like yours and, and many others right now are doing the, the hard work of, of very directly connecting the dots so that we can combine and not sort of have silos, right, of mm -hmm. environment and, and justice, but, but try to put everything together. Um, I want to- All absolutely connected. Yeah. Everything is connected. <laughs> Um, I want to give a minute for uh, audience participation, and mm -hmm. I don't want to um, necessarily call them out, but I do know we have a candidate on, 
on the call today. So Mr. Hicks, if you, you should be able to unmute yourself. If you'd like to say hi, ask a question or tell us why you're running for office or why this um, particular uh, talk today is of interest to you and your race, we'd love to, to hear from you. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, my name is Joshua Hicks. I'm the candidate for State House District 11 over here in the Duval Beaches in Nassau County region against Cord Bird. Um, you know, I have a, an environmental background. I, I worked for the League of Conservation Voters for three and a half years in Washington, D.C. Um, about at this point, about eight years ago now. Uh, under uh, Gene Karpinski and uh, that leadership. Uh, and I worked on the policy and lobbying team as an intern. And then I was on the development team raising funds for our climate champions across the country. Um, so obviously, uh, climate issues and environmental issues are very important to me. Um, here in my district, uh, you know, the beaches uh, go all the way up the coast to my district. Beach all the way up to Fernandina and Amelia Island. Uh, beaches are extremely important. So what I wanted to hear more, sorry, uh, my internet is unstable from time to time. Uh, as Shannon was saying when the call started, uh, the, uh, I wanted to hear more about environmental issues, what F FCV, uh, Jonathan Weber, who's the deputy executive director, is a friend of mine. So I wanted to hear what they were doing uh, statewide. And uh, not to toot my own horn, but I have been endorsed by Sierra Club Florida um, and the uh, Democratic uh, Environmental Caucus of uh, Florida as well. So um, I have my environmental chops. Um, but in terms of uh, environmental issues. I'm extremely interested in sea level rise. Um, the nor'easter and Hurricane Teddy the, uh, the other day did a number on our beaches here locally um, and it just goes to show how we need to act now on sea level rises and uh, our coastal and protect our coastal communities for generations to come. We shouldn't act uh, in the future. We need to make the plans for how we're going to address uh, these environmental disasters today. So uh, thanks for letting me speak for a minute and uh, I applaud um, all the work FCV is doing and um, all the work y'all are doing to, uh, you know, raise environmental issues, not only here locally, but across Florida. Well, thank you, Joshua. Oh. I, I uh, appreciate that. Thanks for being on the call today. Sure, Do we have any other um, uh, questions or comments from uh, audience participants or Aliki, did you have anything that you wanted to, to say to address Josh or anyone else that we didn't get to cover today? Um, the only, uh, let's see, I don't think so, but I will say, Josh, like, come, let's talk. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things, so, you know, you mentioned the, the League of Conservation Voters, that's our national affiliate. Um, the great thing about the partnership that we have with the National League of Conservation Voters, by the way, there are 30, maybe a little, maybe more conservation voter groups around the country. And we all have a very different origin story. Some of us have been around for a really long time. Some of us like, like Florida, we're newer. Um, one of the really great things about the partnership is we co collaboratively figure out like what lanes we're in, right? Because again, resources are limited. And so the national LCV, they make the, they're doing the hard heavy lifting on the presidential race. Um, they're really helping US Congress people get elected. Um, when 2022 comes around, just like they did in 2018, they'll be talking about U.S. senators. And the role that FCV plays in those federal elections is, you know, we and our partners, we're the ones here in Florida who know, who, who know what's going on. Um, and so we provide support to LCV in those national races. Likewise, our focus in Florida is on the state legislature and increasingly as we grow on local candidates county and city commissions. And so the partnership with LCV enables us to reach past Florida for folks who care and understand the state legislature is incredibly important. And this is, I guess the one thing I guess I would leave everybody with is, especially in election time, people, pe there's a lot of attention on the top of the ticket and there's a little bit of attention on the bottom of the ticket because you see your local candidates in the grocery store. The people in between are often forgotten. And the problem with that is the people in between are passing laws that affect our everyday lives. The people in between, for example, are drawing the redistricting lines um, that say which 
which district, which congressperson you get to vote for. Um, the people in the middle, I mean, beyond environmental, I mean, aside from uh, Florida Forever funding, figuring out our water quality problems and making sure that we're addressing water pollution, you know, holding the monopoly utilities feet to the fire and making it so that there's more distributed clean energy in Florida. All those decisions are made by state lawmakers and they're sandwiched in the middle. And so if there's one thing I would say, and I, we always say to folks is like, don't just vote the top of the ticket and then ignore everything else. Like you, you gotta, as painful as it might be, because in many communities, the ballot is pages and pages long, gotta go through the whole thing. <laughs> We're gonna have, uh, we'll have, I don't know what the timeline is, with Shannon, but we have a candidate survey we put out to candidates running in the watershed of the St. John's. And so um, hopefully we'll get a good response from some of the, from the candidates um, and it'll help you as voters, I think, make a determination of where they stand on some of these really important issues that affect the St. John's and affect your lives. Yeah, absolutely. Gary, I see we have a question for you, from you. I, yeah, hopefully you were unmuted. Go ahead. Thank you. Fortunately, I've got a little experience with Zoom. <laughs> Makes them getting used to. Um, I'm new to the area in St. John's County, just coming up on two years. And I'd like to get plugged in. Um, uh, I'm very interested in the environment. I haven't previously been active in environmental issues. I moved here from California, uh, but I want to be here in Florida. I really want to know what's going on, what the issues are, what people are doing or not doing, things like that, so that I'll know, you know, by educating myself, what direction I want to go or can go to help influence uh, conservation and protection of the environment. So if you can, uh, I can put my, my email in the, in the chat and if I can somehow get plugged in and get, get some information via email, uh, things, upcoming events, and things that uh, I can do to educate myself. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gary. I, I think that's a great segue here to my final slide. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to uh, visit the Florida Conservation Voters website, especially right now um, uh, when it's so important to, um, again, begin receiving this um, how to vote, where to vote, how to make sure that your vote counts, um, and then who's running for office and, and who you should vote for via endorsements and um, ways to stay educated. So check out their website. Aliki, thank you so much for joining us today um, and being such an uh, incredible voice for this again, extremely important solution to, um, to climate change. Uh, I wanna last, just encourage everyone to join us for our next episode. Um, we will be discussing wetlands and carbon capture. Lisa Chambers, professor of biology at the University of Central Florida will discuss new science that understands more about wetlands as carbon sinks, holding more carbon within the soil that was than, than has been previously understood. So that'll be an exciting one. Uh, join us then, visit fcvvoters.org. And um, thanks again for everyone for tuning in today. Thanks everyone. Thank you. And if y'all have any, any time, any questions or um, want more information, you can always email Shannon, myself or Aliki. You can just go to our websites and our emails are there um, on the websites. And so we're, we always welcome um, feedback and questions.